Sharon Pedley was on duty at a West Cornwall nursing home the night it was gutted by fire. Oh yeah, they were all in there acting the fool and laughing and dancing and Karen was putting them to bed. It was the curtains in that room that had been set alight and the room itself was absolutely devastated. Both ladies in that room were hospitalised. Fire kills and fire kills horribly. In some respects, you're lucky if you die of smoke inhalation first. One woman did die. How had the fire begun? This wasn't the first time that one of Karen Pedley's places of work had been struck by a suspicious blaze. Fire seems to follow this girl around, and you'd really need to start thinking how and where and what else has happened in the past that we don't know about. It would take years for investigators to link a string of arson attacks. And when they did, they would discover that Karen Pedley was once a hero, raising an alarm at her family home. It was through responding to the fire that Karen got a taste of approval and of of even existing, of, of having any identity of her own. Hailed as a lifesaver, did that incident in Karen's childhood mean she was made for murder? What made Karen the schoolgirl, Karen the killer? Using expert digital imagery from a specialist forensic artist to show the changing faces of a killer, this series reveals the life timelines and the red flags of those who will one day be investigated for taking a life. It was at the age of 10 when Karen became the local hero. She saved her family from a house fire. Karen discovered a fire that had begun in the airing cupboard at her family home. She alerted her parents. Everyone was safely evacuated from the house. She was praised and lauded in the local press for saving her family from a blaze that eventually gutted their house. She was awarded a trip on Concord, featured in the local newspaper, and for a little while was really quite something. Little Karen had saved the lives of her six brothers and sisters. Now infirm, one remembers how close she had been to losing her life. Flames were coming out and I had to jump the flames to get out of the house. I was the last one out. And we lost everything, absolutely everything, in that house fire. It was a big moment in the life of a little girl. One who may have felt that no one had taken very much notice of. Criminologist Jane Moncton-Smith and forensic psychologist Dr Donna Youngs have been tracing the life and the crime of Karen Pedley. Six siblings struggling for attention in normal circumstances, but in this family, my sense is that she was barely identified as a, a separate human being. It would have all been, a, a, you know, very chaotic, probably. And unless you've got quite dedicated, caring and skilled parents, children get very lost in that kind of atmosphere. To any child, the amount of attention that Karen Pedley got for saving the day when this fire broke out in the family home would impact upon them. But to someone whose childhood, whose upbringing to this point was so psychologically barren, the impact um, on her and on who she became would have been absolutely enormous. Some family members deny that Karen was not shown enough attention when a child, but they all agree that she was fated in the paper, praised in the local community, rewarded with a trip on Concord. This was an extraordinary moment in Karen's otherwise ordinary existence, but it couldn't last. The thing with these kinds of of stories is they have a shelf life you know they would only last maybe a couple of weeks at best and Karen Pedley would have very very quickly been thrown unceremoniously back into that life where she was probably or felt like she was nobody. The impact of the episode was far longer lasting. Forensic psychologist Dr Donna Youngs believes the fire acquired a very special place in the heart of Karen Pedley. 
Karen Pedley, within a family background where I think there's probably a real deficit of communication and a meaningful emotional communication, fire becomes her way of communicating with the outside world. It's her way of getting attention, it's her way of making a point, it's her way of, of striking out in revenge. It's her way of having an identity. Shortly after their home was gutted by fire, the family relocated from Bedfordshire to Cornwall in England. Karen Stringer grew up and married, becoming Mrs. Karen Pedley. She had children and she found a number of uh, casual work in the local Cornwall area. In a large extended family, nephew Junior remembers Karen as his fun auntie. She was a really caring auntie. We should take us out on a moped. Yeah, she was a bit reckless, but it was like she was safe at doing it. Like she wouldn't put us in any danger. And if she knew something was going to happen, she'd make it stop before it did happen. Out of all the aunts and uncles that I had, my auntie Karen was my favourite because she was there for us. She was really supportive. But while Karen came across as happy and carefree, her life was far from rosy. Karen Pedley did not have an easy life. She clearly struggled with many elements of life. She had a menial job. She couldn't even hold that down. She seemed to have an uneven career, often getting fired from some pubs and places such as that. In 2002, Karen Pedley got a job as a cleaner at the Trafula House Nursing Home in St. Day. Shortly after she started, a fire broke out. No one was hurt, and no one could work out how it had started. No arrests were made after a short investigation. In 2006, Karen and her family moved to the village of Carharrick. Curiously, the mysterious fires seemed to follow her. She worked at a shop, a care home, and a working men's club. And at some stage, all of those premises were set alight. It seemed if Karen got cross, fire would follow soon after. On a number of occasions with these fires, they seem to relate to places where she'd left in some degree of acrimony, whether that's been fired or whatever. She was very often the person who called the fire brigade, and she was very often the first person on scene. Karen lost her job at one care home when the manager found her asleep under a table during a night shift. A few days later, the home suffered an arson attack. Some patterns started to build in Karen Pedley's life, and fire actually formed a big part of those patterns. In a lot of the jobs that she had, there would be fires afterwards, and especially it seems when maybe she'd left on bad terms. And it started to build a picture. Certainly for us looking back, we can see a picture of fire after fire after fire but she seemed to be getting away with it at the time and nobody was joining the dots it seemed that karen pedley had found a way of feeling in control in a life that was often chaotic i can see that that somebody um who must have felt so powerless it's not surprising that somebody like that would be instinctively instinctually drawn to, to something as, as potent and, and something that has such a life of its own as fire. Criminologist Dr Jane Monkton-Smith believes playing this role was all part of the thrill for Karen Pedley. This is a mania. This is a compulsion. This is something that is taking over her thoughts way too much of the time. And very, very often those people will want to be there once the fire is set. That is the glory moment for them. It's such a huge drama and all because of them. They created it. Nobody had been hurt so far because of the fires that Pedley had begun. She was not under suspicion, so she could get work in places where a fire might easily cause death, where people were vulnerable. In 2008, she got a job at a care home in Cornwall, where, of course, elderly and vulnerable people lived. She was described as unassuming, somebody who just went about their work quietly. The manager of the Rosewind House Care Home is Jenny Spargo. 
We were just like one big family. They were my family then. We also had flats which were for the people who were much more able, but they used to come in and come into our place for lunch and they come in for tea and come in and join with the activities and then if they became poorly, they could then move into the home. And it was just like basically one big happy family. Rosewood House felt safe to those who lived and worked there. Good enough for Jenny to put her own mum there. My mother was there for four and a half years. I also lived there, which meant I was there 24-7. Um, so they obviously were more a family to me than anything else, really. So it was just the way I lived. It wasn't a job anymore. It was just my life. Rosewyn for Jenny was a labour of love, but in the nursing home sector, recruitment is a well-known problem. It's not easy to employ staff. And it's not always easy to employ, like, 20-year-old ladies as well, women or children, you know. It can be quite difficult sometimes. It was in 2008 that Ruswin House at Alverton Terrace in Truro got the call from Karen Pedley, looking for work. She had good references. There was no indication that she wouldn't be a useful addition to the team. She came originally, I think, to be a, a cook or a cleaner. or She was going to be domestic side, but she, she did a bit of cooking, she did a bit of cleaning, but she could also do care as well. At the time, she seemed to fit in with everybody, and I didn't have any complaints from anybody, so no reason to think there was any problems, really. She wasn't on a barred list. She didn't have convictions which meant that she would be recognised as someone who shouldn't be working with vulnerable people. There were no red flags on Karen Pedley's employment record. Her troubling backstory was yet to be uncovered. The little girl who had grown to be the woman who played with fire was all set to be a threat and was not concerned who might get burnt. On the day of the fire, um, I got up like normal, went to school and... The bell rang for her school to finish, and it just felt normal, like we were waiting for our mum, and then we just got kept in the office. And then, I think it was like an hour later, my mum turned up and said that the house had been on fire. In 2008, despite her chequered employment history, Karen Pedley was working at Rosewyn Residential Nursing Home in Truro. Before long, she was taking responsibility for the lives and well-being of the elderly residents. As far as we know, had all the normal duties of a care assistant. And they're actually quite difficult, um, quite physical sometimes. So that would be maybe dealing with the continence issues of patients, maybe turning them, making sure that they don't get sores, helping them to eat. Nobody ever sort of came to me with complaints, but and sometimes I didn't really see very much of her. She didn't work full time all the time, so it was sort of a bit hit and miss, I suppose, with her really. There were no complaints about Karen, but she had a few concerns of her own. For one thing, she told how she was convinced that the nursing home was a fire risk. During that time there, she had mentioned to her sister that she was really, really concerned about the state of some of the electrics in the residents' rooms, it seemed to be suggesting that they were a fire risk. She kept whinging about it. She was saying about the electrics at the, pl at the place. They could see the wire, you could see, uh, you could see all the plug sockets were hanging out. The socket was on, off the wall, and you could see all the leads there. And there was a fire, gas, there was a fire in one, electric fire in one of the rooms. And you can see the wires in that. She said it was just, it was wrong the way the place was. It needed redoing. Was Karen Pedley being safety conscious or was she laying the groundwork to return to her old tricks? Greg, who was one of the owners, he used to do all the, um, the fire drills and the, the things like this. And she was always pestering him for more training and talking about fires. And she seemed to be wanting to know lots about the fire and where things were and um, always wanted more fire exercises done and more information on fire training and um, 
but he thought she was just interested. So I actually told him how she'd rescued somebody, and this was down at the seafarers at Falmouth, how she'd worked there and she'd rescued somebody from the home when it caught on fire. In fact, while Karen was working at the seafarers' hostel, fires had broken out in three of the elderly residents' rooms. In what appeared a fortuitous coincidence, Karen had been on hand to help rescue the vulnerable gentleman who lived there. Later, it would become clear she had started the fires. She needed to be seen as the hero. It's whenever she feels particularly suppressed psychologically, when her, her self-esteem is particularly low, I think she's going to resort, she's going to go back to what she knows. And for Karen Pedley, that's starting a fire. And what followed, what she assumes will always follow, is the esteem, is the approval, is the sense of mattering that I think is so missing in Karen's life. 2008 was the year that Karen Pedley took her risky game to the next level. On one chilly night in late November, things were peaceful at Rosewood House. Well, it had been a sort of normal day, as far as I can remember. Um, I'd been out in the evening, and I'd come back into the home, and my mother was there. So I went in every night and made sure she was in bed and she was OK. On the 23rd of November, Miss um, Spargo went home. On her way out, she noticed that uh, Karen was actually in one of the rooms with one of the residents and seemed to be having lots of fun dancing with them. Those residents were 96-year-old Gladys Rowe and her roommate, Olive Ray. Karen was with them in room five, along with a co-worker called Catherine. I'd seen Karen was with Catherine, putting Joan and Gladys to bed. Um, they had music on and they were singing and laughing and playing around. Jenny walked to her house just a few yards away on the same site as the nursing home. I'd then gone over and got ready for bed and within about 20-25 minutes I had a phone call to say can you come over here there's, there's a room on fire. When Jennifer Spargo arrived at the nursing home there was a scene of chaos. There were The elderly residents were being evacuated from their rooms. Now she went straight up to room five there was smoke billowing out from there, and she just couldn't get in. I tried to open the door, and I couldn't because the room was just black. And I would say in 48 years of care, it's the worst thing I've ever done. And it was just horrible. It was just a horrible, horrible night. So I just opened it slightly, and, I, and it was completely black. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't see a thing. The fire had begun in room five, the room of Gladys Rowe and Olive Ray, the room that Karen Pedley had been seen in by colleagues minutes before. On the night of the fire in Rosewyn House, it was a point of comment that uh, Karen Pedley was, seemed quite excitable, quite happy. She was jumping around and dancing with the residents, which wasn't her usual behaviour, but it kind of indicates that she was looking forward to something, thinking about it, and, and it was exciting her. That something was her latest arson attack. What Karen Pedley did here was to light a fire in the bedroom of somebody who was almost certainly, even if they were in good physical shape, not going to be able to escape because they were asleep at the time. By the time they woke, the fire could almost certainly have engulfed the room. Not only did she do that, but she actually chose to do so in the room of very, very vulnerable older people who were not going to be fit to run away. Arsonists, in my opinion, all show a deep lack of compassion but this is taking it to another level. The fire service were called. This was a big fire. This was a serious fire. And it didn't take the fire service very long to work out where the seat of that fire was. And they found that that fire had been started in room five. Jenny Spargo was immediately suspicious about how the fire had started. Fire doors in the home were designed to close to stop fire spreading. But the one in room five 
had not closed. The trouble is, because you've been so meticulous with what you do, and, and with training and the fire regulations, you keep thinking there's got to be something more to this. Could a careless smoker, one of the residents perhaps, have caused the fire? Nobody smoked in their bedrooms. None of the, we had a smoking area because elderly people, I'm afraid, do smoke. <laughs> in fact, some of them were very hairy smokers, but we only had a couple that smoked. As Jenny struggled to solve the mystery, there was tragic news from the hospital. Five days after the blaze, one of the women evacuated from room five died, 96-year-old Gladys Rowe. Well, Gladys had been with us for nine years. She was quite a character, you know? She was just a well-known person in Truro. And um, a lot of my grandchildren used to come up and they always used to go and talk to Gladys because Gladys would tell them tales about what happened years ago, which was, you know, really quite interesting. They loved it. Gladys was still alive when she was rescued from Room 5, but the damage to her lungs had been done. A small community was in shock. Then, to heap tragedy upon tragedy, Gladys's roommate Olive Ray died. Investigators did everything they could, but the cause of the fire remained a mystery. From the very beginning, when it was found by the fire service that this was a suspicious fire, Karen Pedley tried to deflect the blame, She in, in, not just away from herself, but on to another specific person. We weren't allowed to go up there anymore. We weren't allowed to go in the room, and the dogs came up with the fire people to check for accelerants and then they ripped up the floorboards and we had to wait and they said they couldn't find anything at all whatsoever um, so it, basically that night it was all speculation of of what happened it seems that suspicion fell very very quickly onto karen she was arrested but was released on bail as this was going to be a real protracted inquiry cases like this can be extremely difficult to investigate, especially if there's no forensic evidence and no independent witnesses. Pedley was soon released. There was not enough evidence to lay a charge. And as time passed to Jenny Spargo and the Truro community, it looked as though the investigation had ground to a halt. You keep thinking there's got to be something more to this. And... We had to go to the police and give statements and um, whatever. And then it all went quiet until, well, I think it was two or three years later that they actually had the inquest. This arson was quite difficult to prove for the police. But, but you know, they were working in the background. But there would be no immediate breakthrough. So Karen's trail of death and destruction were far from over. Pedley is clearly and utterly obsessed with starting fires. There are very few more dangerous types of people. And her next targets would be her own family. But that, like, my Auntie Karen was making jokes and everything, which wasn't the right moment to do anything like that. No one linked the incidents of fire which Karen Pedley had caused throughout her life. As a 10-year-old, she'd been linked to a fire at her family home. As she became a young woman, she took jobs where fires would soon begin. After marriage, she'd set alight her sister's home. And in 2010, she struck again. So a couple of years after the fire at the care home, Karen's sister experienced a fire that broke out under the stairs in her house. Karen's sister, Jenny Stringer, lived with her children in a town called Hale in Cornwall, some 14 miles from Karen's home. Karen's nephew, Junior, remembers it well. He has good reason to. On the day of the fire, um, I got up like normal, went to school, and the bell rang for her school to finish. And it just felt normal, like we were waiting for our mum. And then we just got kept in the office. And then, I think it was like an hour later, my mum turned up and said that the house had been on fire. And by the time we got back to the house, we had three fire engines and everything there. Um, and they were still in the building at the time. As the family began to process what had happened, 
an odd detail emerged. After Jenny had called the fire brigade, she called Karen. She told me she was at home anyway. And uh, literally within five minutes, she was at my house. And it was like my auntie lives like half an hour away and she was there within five minutes, which we felt really strange. It was certainly strange, and if detectives had known of her past, suspicion would very quickly have fallen on Karen Pedley. Because arson is one step removed, that it can be very difficult to pick up arsonists and that what detectives will regularly do is to look for somebody who was first on the scene, who was suspiciously helpful, who wants to insert themselves into any investigation. That certainly, in retrospect, appears to be the situation with Karen Pedley. As the family considered what to do next, Karen appeared strangely elated. My auntie Karen was making jokes and everything. And there was a bag of crisps on the floor and she went, does anyone want any smoky bacon crisps? which wasn't the right moment to do anything like that. I was crying my eyes out. Um, I got told, we weren't, got told we weren't allowed to go in the building. But I went, no, it's my house at the end of the day. It was Karen who was there to pick up the pieces after this fire and to offer her sister and her sister's children help in getting them somewhere to stay. So we stayed at my auntie Karen's in Carharrick for, I think it was like three months. It's like a compulsion with her. She's, she's got to do it. it. It's just filling her mind most of the time. And Karen, you know, very generously allows her sister to come and live with her and, and, and again becomes a little bit of a hero in the situation. This is remarkably similar, where she becomes then the hero after a fire. We can trace this right back to 1983. By 2010, on at least seven occasions when there had been an unexplained fire, Karen Pedley had been on hand to save the day or had recently been in the building. The fatal fire at Rosemont House did not stop her. Even after this blaze where Karen Pedley is a suspect and she knows she's a suspect, she's, she's not in custody. There, there's no evidence against her, against her at this stage. But she doesn't stop setting fires. It was now that Karen's close family witnessed her playing the knight in shining armour. The pattern seemed to be, and that, that wherever Karen Pedley was, there was a fire. And not only was she there, she was always the one who would call the police. She would be there at the scene, watching the catastrophe of her work. Probably reliving some of that glory that she felt that time when she was 10 years old, when she became a hero and she got all of that attention. Given the lack, I think, of any other meaningful uh, emotional life, I think the moment the incident happened uh, and all the approval and the media attention that followed happened, I think it was very likely that Karen Pedley was going to, whenever things went wrong when she's older, try and reenact this situation. For eight years, from 2002 to 2010, no one suspected Karen Pedley, who continued to act like a supportive, caring auntie. That's the kind of person she was. Like she would do anything for her family. And she wouldn't let us down. Later that year, firefighters attended a house blaze in the village of Carharrick, just two minutes from where Karen Pedley lived. It was the eighth fire that would eventually be linked to Pedley. She'd already caused one death, and it seemed nothing would stop her before she struck again. Karen Pedley clearly had no empathy for other people. She had no feeling for anybody except herself. This is a woman who had children and who, despite that, was prepared to set fires which are always going to carry a risk of her being convicted. She had no thought for the impact that her conviction and notoriety might have on her own family. To bring Karen Pedley to justice, something had to happen for detectives to build a case. Jenny Spargo had never been satisfied that the blaze at Rosewind House had been an accident. For two years, she, her boss Greg, and their colleagues had been asking questions and forming theories. 
I suppose, to be honest, my, my suspicions were Karen. One of my staff had a friend who worked in another home, and apparently she'd worked there and there'd been a fire there as well. And, and I think this is what sort of put us, you know, thinking, no, there's, there's more to this. And then we put together that she mentioned about the seafarers as well, so that was another problem. So we just had to go with our gut instinct, I suppose. Instinct told them that Karen Pedley had something to do with it, not least because the day after the fire, she had walked out of the care home and simply never returned. She failed to turn up for her next shift. In the end, Greg actually spent two and a half years pushing the police and pushing and pushing and pushing. And he was, that's what he did basically for two and a half years. In 2012, detectives made a breakthrough. After a tip off, they were granted a warrant to search Karen Pedley's home. What they found was eye opening. They searched her house and they found a scrapbook full of newspaper clippings from that incident back in 1983 when she supposedly saved her family. For three decades, Karen had treasured the memory of 1983 when, for a few short weeks, she'd been a hero. When everybody is applauding you, everyone's congratulating you, all eyes are upon you, you are not going to forget that moment. It was through responding to the fire that Karen got a taste of, of approval um, and of, of even existing, of, of having any identity of her own. I think it's not surprising that um, when anybody tries to push her down, keep her down, when anything goes wrong in her life, she tries to recreate these conditions. Had detectives found a motive for Karen Pedley to start fires, one of which had claimed a life? The discovery of the scrapbook kick-started the investigation once again. Then further inquiries into her background, her places that she lived, and her places of work, they started to find a pattern of fires happening wherever Karen Pedley happened to be. At this stage, alarm bells are going to start ringing. Fire seems to follow this girl around, and you'd really need to start thinking how and where and what else has happened in the past that we don't know about. Investigators have now uncovered the pattern of suspicious blazers starting at places with links to Karen Pedley. But as she continued to set fires, could they prove it and stop her before there was another tragedy? And what part would her family play in her plan to avoid detection? To be truthful, I didn't think it had anything to do with my auntie. And it was like, you read everything and it just comes out that she was the only one working on that day. In 2013, Karen Pedley may have felt nervous. Police were investigating at least 12 suspicious fires across West Cornwall, and by then, she was their number one suspect for causing the death of an elderly lady at Rosewind Care Home. There's clear evidence she made real efforts to cover her tracks and try and take suspicion away from herself. Pedley felt she needed the family's help. My mum had a phone call from the police to say that my auntie Karen wants her to make a statement to say that she was with, that my mum was with her when there was a care home fire. And my mum said no. As detectives kept digging, they discovered that in the wake of one arson attack, Karen had forced a co-worker to back up her alibi. From the very beginning when it was found by the fire service that this was a suspicious fire, Karen Pedley tried to deflect the blame, She in, in, not just away from herself, but on to another specific person. And she became very, very difficult to deal with over this, and she became threatening. She even threatened this other person that she was going to burn their house down, which seems a very strange thing to do when you have been perhaps under suspicion of arson. Originally, a co-worker didn't tell the truth to the police. But a short while later, her conscience got the better of her and she finally told the truth. And that truth was that Karen Pedley had threatened her. It was then that investigators learned that Pedley was often the first person to report the fires and would be present when firefighters arrived at the scene offering her suggestions about how the blazers could have begun. 
the net began to close in, but building a case would be tough. Now this is a case investigating historic crimes like this, where you may not have any huge, great, big bits of evidence. This is what we call similar fact evidence. We'll try and present the evidence that Karen Pedley, in a number of occasions, in almost identical situations, had set a fire or been close to where a fire was set, had been the one to call the police. In February 2015, now living 400 miles away in Newcastle upon Tyne, Karen Pedley was arrested. Her nephew, Junior Stringer, couldn't believe the claims. Didn't think it had anything to do with my auntie. And it was like, you read everything and it just comes out that she was the only one working on that day. And it was like the night when the fire happened and like, she just try, like you just try and think, well, no, it's got nothing to do with my family. Charged with almost a dozen arsons dating back to 2002, the attempted murder of Olive Ray and the murder of Gladys Rowe, Karen Pedley was remanded in custody. Even in jail, her urge to start fires was too strong to ignore. She sets fire to her own cell. I mean, it, this, this compulsion that she has, she, she doesn't seem to realise how it's constantly pointing the finger back at her that she is actually guilty of, of all these fires. When the case came to court, there seemed to be a significant amount of evidence against her. There seemed to be all the similar facts around all the number of fires that we believe total about 14. Obviously, the worst of these was the one where, unfortunately, Gladys passed away as a direct result of that, and the jury convicted her. It was a moment of truth for Karen Petty's family. She tried denying it all the way through her life, and it's like we found out that she'd done that many fires, and it was... We just couldn't believe her anymore. The realisation that it was Auntie Karen who'd taken everything from him as a child hit Junior even harder. So when I found out that she set the fire in my home, um, I was really shocked because she denied like, all the fires she'd done. But it was when she went to court and she admitted to the one that she'd done in my home. Like, that was it. I had nothing more to do with the family. We didn't want anything to do with them. A psychiatrist report found that Karen to be of low intelligence with a personality disorder. Junior Stringer wonders if her actions all go back to the event that had defined her childhood. I have wondered why so many times, but to be truthful, I don't think I'll ever have an answer for why she wanted to do that. So I think she's had it where if she sets a fire and then she'll save everyone. It seems to me that Karen Pedley wanted to be the hero of the day. We can trace that back to 1983, and it shows up again when she magically appears on scene when her sister's house is on fire. I think it made her feel good about herself. In fact, at Pedley's trial, there was speculation about the origins of that devastating blaze in Karen's childhood home. She had been thought a hero, but was she actually the villain of the piece? To this day, we still don't know whether it was her, but hearing from the judge... He's, like, he was the one who was saying that it could possibly be her because that's where she's got it from, where if she saves someone, she'll get a reward and she got the reward of going on the Concord. I think it's possible that she did set the fire, but I don't think at this stage that she was an arsonist. I think she may have, uh, as, as many children do, simply have been, been playing with, with matches. It wasn't the fire itself, but rather how her actions were received that fed Karen's pyromania as she grew. When you have the complete deprivation of attention and the complete deprivation of any understanding of right and wrong, it produces um, what can almost be likened to a, an almost feral child, a child almost raised in the wild. Now, a feral child uh, who will do almost anything to survive um, is an absolute blank page, is absolutely primed for any um, salient, any strong psychological episodes, any definitive episodes, such as, such as, such as what happened uh, purely possibly by chance in Karen Pedley's life with the fire and her coming across a fire in her family home. Um, to, on, such a, on such a blank page, on such a psychologically um, uh, empty landscape, this would have in, enormously impacted her. 
Karen Pedley had become a woman made for murder, not through her desire to see people die, but by failing to connect fire with lethal danger. I really don't think that she would have been deliberately using fire, particularly in the early days, um, to harm other human beings. I think it was... Uh, a statement, a, a, an outburst, a, a reaction, rather than a premeditated attempt at murder in the early days. Fire was her obsession. Indeed, sentencing Pedley, the judge expressed astonishment that she had continued to start fires even after the death of Gladys Rowe. Karen Pedley was, was felt compelled to keep setting fires. Gladys Rowe's death would not have ended that compulsion. To put it very, very bluntly, Gladys Rowe was collateral damage in her wider campaign of arson. I don't think she really probably cared that much, if at all, that somebody had died. It may have added to the drama. I would view Karen Pedley as being at risk for the rest of her life. She uses fire as a weapon. I think she feels fire gives her an enormous sense of power. Had Pedley's early years contributed to a state of mind where she simply didn't have a sense of right and wrong, where she didn't feel enough empathy to stop her committing harm? I don't think she's ever mattered to anybody particularly. Um, so when you have that kind of upbringing, then other people do not have the same significance that they do to you, to you or I. Um, and I think that that's what we're seeing here, that although she had quite friendly relationships with the old people that she was caring for and knew them, and we know that she danced with, with, with them and played with them, ultimately uh, her need for uh, esteem, her need to matter, her need to feel this sense of uh, significance again would override any other human human emotions. Karen Pedley was jailed for a minimum of 27 years for the murder of 96-year-old Gladys Rowe, who was fatally injured in the fire at Rosen House in November 2008. She was further given 14 life sentences for her numerous acts of arson. She was found not guilty of the attempted murder of Olive Ray. Karen Pedley, a child who became a hero, an employee who took out her grudges by setting ablaze those places where she had lost jobs, an aunt and sister who played the Good Samaritan after she herself had set another house on fire. She had become a woman who played with fire and in the process was made for murder. It was inevitable that at some stage her carelessness with human life would end in somebody being killed. <laughs>